can we step back to the 80s when yeah. you started WPP? What was your original yeah. M&A strategy? Well, if you if you go uh, back to the original document, which I think still exists, you can find it in Company's House or wherever. Uh, we said our, our objective in, in the in the circular that went to shareholders to approve it uh, or pro approve the uh, the it was issue of new shares to Preston Rather and myself. It, it said our our objective was to build a major multinational marketing services company. That was it. And uh, so uh, when you start, of course, with a wire basket manufacturer and you want to try and do it in your in your own uh, life, you know, uh, organic growth is stronger, but it takes longer. So you're probably dead and buried before you, you get to any scale. So uh, if we were going to do it on any scale, and in fact, if we were going to build a business, it had to be done um, not organically or not just organically, but by... Uh, m and and in those days, uh, acquisitions were the way of doing it. Uh, today, I think it's very different. It's mergers, but we'll come on to that. But uh, in those days, it was, how do you come? We, I think in the first 18 months, we acquired 18 companies. And then, of course, the, 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 the breakthrough, if you like, was J. Walt, JWT Group, which people forget was not just the agency, which is now no longer, very sadly. Uh, but it it consisted of the media part of the business, which is now Mindshare, the chair, which continues to thrive. Uh, it, it consisted of uh, Hill and Melton. Uh, actually, it consisted of an agency called Lord Geller, uh, which uh, had a sad end to it when, when, when the management walked out with the IBM business, which they promptly lost, and which came back, the IBM business came back, actually, in uh, 1992. It was about three years later, interestingly, from when it departed and then of course you had MRB market research bureau which uh, included BMRB quite a famous research company here in the UK and that was the core or part of Cantar which is now part of Bain Capital so you know we had a fast fast start but the breakthrough was JWT group which was 13 times our size how much did you pay for those on average those businesses uh, well what do you mean in terms of multiples multiple or? wise well, I can't recall what the multiple was. We paid five twenty-five for JWT, and because we found the Japanese property, well, we knew there was a freehold property. We thought it was Barclay Square, but it turned out to be Japan. So that was a gross of two hundred million. We had to pay a hundred million tax, but that reduced the the net purchase price by a hundred million. Of course, margins were appalling at JWT, and we improved the margins. So that was a great buy. Ogilvy, I can't remember. I think it was about twice our size. Uh, was about 825 million, no properties there, and I made the mistake of funding it uh, in part by convertible preferred and forgot uh, that a convertible preferred is really debt, and particularly in a bear market where the conversion rights have no value, and so we were saddled with debt, and of course we had to do a restructuring in, in 1991, so it was a bit of the perils of Pauline, but but you know, we did manage to fight our way through. So in terms of multiples in those days, I would say, you know, JWT looked on the surface to be a high multiple. <clears throat> but when you looked at the underlying potential profitability, I mean, we, we, we did very well out of JWT, not just because of the property, but because they had some good assets. We brought Burt Manning back to run the agency. Don Johnson, who was the CEO of JWT Group, had, had got rid of Burt a year or so previously, who was his natural successor. So it was highly political. Uh, Ken Roman, really, uh, uh, there was a disgruntled bunch inside Ogilvy about Ken Roman. M made, well, actually, uh, David Ogilvy, he didn't have a good relationship on the surface, it appeared to be, but it really wasn't when you dug through it. And when we sent the, uh, the fax attack, as we called it, in uh, 1989 to Roman, he... he he, he removed the last paragraph of the letter so David didn't, when he showed the letter to David Ogilvy, so David didn't, uh, didn't see that we had suggested he become chairman of the joint company. But um, anyway, uh, that, that, that's, that's all, all history. So, you know, value-wise, those were good deals. Uh, even today, with, with the, the destruction of, uh, of JWT, the agency, which is extremely sad, <clears throat> not not just because you know isn't this is not just a reflection of history it's value and i and i think um management comes in with big boots and stamps all over the history 
um, you know, it's an ageist attitude, not just to people, but an ageist attitude to companies in a bizarre way. I mean, corporate memory is lost. I mean, I remember when I went into JWT Group, um, Jeremy Bullmore and Stephen King were being shown the exit door uh, by um, by by Miles Colebrook and Alan Thomas, and I uh, who were taking over JWT, and, you know, and it was the young guns, the young lions. Again, in a way, it was very similar to what we're seeing today, pushing out the old without any reference or understanding. There's an Israeli professor who talks about the difference between wisdom and intelligence. Older people, he says, have wisdom; younger people have intelligence. At the end of this little uh, YouTube video, he says, uh, make sure your companies are run by wise people and that intelligent people work for them. So the, the older people run the business because they have the wisdom and the younger people who have the intelligence work for them. So I, I, and I think there's, that's very similar. And so I, I, took, I said to Jeremy and Stephen, join our board. And to this day, Jeremy still, still is at, uh, at WPP, I'm glad to say. That's one thing. That, that as he's a leading national treasurer, if they booted him out, uh, there would be up, uproar.